Hello everyone and welcome to Prof Talks. Today we will discuss ICH Q3 guideline for residual solvents. If we look at ICH Q3 guideline, there are different guidelines provided under this section. First, there's ICH Q3A, which is impurities in the new drug substance. There's Q3B, which is impurities in the new drug product. Q3C is the guideline for residual solvents. Q3D is the guideline for elemental impurities. This guideline for elemental impurities we have already discussed and uploaded a presentation. Link is available in the description box. And there's one new guideline coming up that is Q3E, which is assessment and control of extractables and leachables. In this presentation, we will have a look at the guideline for the residual solvents that is ICH Q3C. This guideline includes introduction, scope, then there is general principles which include classification of residual solvents by risk assessment, method for establishing the exposure limit, options for describing limits for class 2 solvents, analytical procedures, reporting level for residual solvents. Then there is limit for residual solvents that has been defined into this guideline which includes the solvents to be avoided, solvents to be limited, solvents with low toxic potential, and solvents which have no adequate toxicological data available. There are few appendix provided, like appendix 1 is the list of solvents, appendix 2 is an additional background, and appendix 3 is the method of establishing the exposure limits. We'll cover this method of establishing the exposure limit during the presentation. We'll specifically not touch all the appendix like appendix 1, 2 and 3. Before moving ahead, please ensure that you are subscribed to the channel Prof Talks and have pressed the bell icon so that you can receive the notifications of the upcoming presentations. Moving into the details of the ICH Q3 guideline, that is introduction. If we look at residual solvents, they are the organic volatile chemicals that are either used or produced in the manufacture of a drug substance or excipients or in the preparation of the drug product. These solvents are of no therapeutic benefit. Hence, they are not completely removed by the practical manufacturing techniques that are employed during the production of a product. Thus, they should be removed to an extent possible to meet the product specification in line with the safety data. The objective of this guideline is to recommend acceptable amount of residual solvents in the pharmaceuticals for safety of the patient. If we look at the scope, this guideline is applicable to all the drug substance, excipients and the drug products. It applies to all the dosage forms and routes of administration. The guideline specifies that testing should be performed when production or purification process are known to result in the presence of, of these residual solvents in the products. This is only in the case where that are used or produced, that is the residual solvents that are either used into the manufacturing process or they are produced during subsequent steps in the manufacturing. A cumulative method may be used to calculate the residual solvents in the drug product from levels in the ingredients used to manufacture the product. If level is less or the guideline specified limit, then no testing is required. If level is above, then there should be testing. Also, testing to be done when residual solvent is used during the manufacturing. This guideline does not apply to the products that are for the clinical research purpose or the already existed marketed products. Moving ahead with the classification of residual solvents by risk assessment. WHO guidelines specify a terminology that is ADI, acceptable daily intake, to determine the solvents that should be limited. However, for ICH, the terminology PDE, that is permitted daily exposure is used. We have seen the details of PDE in our previous presentation on ICH Q3D, that is elemental impurities. We will further see the details in this presentation as well. For residual solvents, there are three class of residual solvents, class 1, class 2 and class 3. The class 1 solvents, they are hazardous solvents and they should be avoided into the manufacturing process or they should be limited appropriately. They are non-human carcinogen and have environmental hazards. 
The example includes benzene, carbon tetrachloride, 1 to dichloroethane, etc. A detailed list have been provided into this guideline. Then there are class 2 solvents which are to be limited. They are non genotoxic animal carcinogen and possible agents for irreversible toxicity like neurotoxicity or teratogenicity. The example includes acetonitrile, chlorobenzene, chloroform, etc. Then there are class 3 solvents. They are with low toxic potential and they have no health bait exposure limit is needed. So they have a high PD of uh, 50 mg or more. So this include acetic acid, acetone, anisol, heptane, etc. Now we look into the methods of establishing the exposure limits. PDE as we have seen is determined either by two factors that is no observed effect level or low observed effect level in the most relevant animal study. So the formula for calculating PDE is no observed effect level into weight adjustment upon five factors like F1, F2, F3, F4 and F5. Here F1 is a factor to account for extrapolation between species. So there is an amount of value given for extrapolation for example from rats to human or from mice to human etc. F2 is an adjustment factor which is always considered as 10. F3 is a variable factor to account for toxicity studies for short term exposure and the values are clearly specified in the guideline. And F4 is a factor that may be applied for severe teratotoxicity. Exposure limits for class 1 solvents should be determined with huge of large safety factor mostly like around 10,000 to 100,000 with respect to no observed effect level. Detection and quantitation of these solvents should be by state of an art analytical techniques. Accepted exposure level in this guideline for class 2 solvents are established using the PDE values according to the procedures for setting the limits in the pharmacy. So the values have been provided for class 1 and class 2 solvents and they should not be separately calculated and they can be used directly as such. If you look and calculating the options for describing the limits for class 2 solvents. So there are two options used. One is option 1 and the other is option 2. Option 1 is used for the drug products where the daily dose is maximum of uh, 10 gram and uh, option 2 is used where the daily dose is more than 10 grams. The concentration in ppm for the allowed criteria is calculated as 1000 into the PDE value that is given into the guideline divided by dose. So in the option 1 the dose is always considered to be as 10 mg and in option 2 the formula is same 1000 into the PDE value provided upon the dose where dose can be anything above 10 mg. For option 1, all the individual excipients and the drug substance that is used into the manufacturing of drug product should comply with the concentration PPM limit. For example, if you see the concentration PPM limit is determined to be a certain value and if there are 2-3 excipients and 1 drug substance, so all these individual excipients and drug substance should be within that specific limit. We will see the particular example uh, ahead. And in the option 2 case, it is not necessary for all the individual excipients and the drug substance to meet the criteria of the concentration PPM. However, the limit that is the PDE limit which is given in milligram per day that has to be applied and all and the overall final drug product should meet that criteria. It is applied by adding amount of solvent present in each component. If we take an example, so in the previous slide we have seen the PDE value for acetonitrile is 4.1 mg per day. So we do not have to calculate this specific value. <coughs> it is already given. So considering the above formula, we will do the calculation to determine the concentration in PPM that is 1000 into 4.1 and the dose as we have seen is already always 10. So which comes out to be as 410 PPM. So now in this case, if we consider some example where there are two excipients and one drug product, so all the excipients and the drug product and the, sorry, the drug substance should have the acetonitrile content less than 410 ppm, then only it will comply as per option 1. For option 2, if we see the PDE value given is 4.1 milligram per day. 
so if we determine the milligram exposure for each excipient and the drug substance and add it to give a cumulative value and if that value is less than the pde value then it complies to option 2 so we'll see how this calculation is done for example if we take the uh, uh, example of considering the acetonitrile content where the pde is 4.1 so if you can see there's a drug substance which is uh, 0.3 gram which is having an acetonitrile content of 800 ppm and daily exposure is calculated from acetonitrile content and the amount in the formulation which comes out to be as 0.24 mg excipient 1 is 0.9 gram having a 400 ppm value these values we have not calculated 800 ppm 400 ppm these are already available from the literature and this is just an example an excipient 2 3.8 gram with uh, acetonitrile content of 800 ppm and the daily exposure which calculated which comes out to be as 3.04 mg so the overall drug product is 5 gram where acetonitrile cumulative in ppm comes out to be as 728 ppm and daily exposure based on the uh, weight of the drug like amount in the formulation and the acetonitrile content it comes out to be 3.64 mg so now we have seen option one the concentration uh, allowed concentration is 410 ppm and for option 2 pd value it is 4.1 mg per day so if we look at the value table uh, here and the acetonitrile content you can see that from all the excipients only excipient 1 is complying with the criteria that is below 410 ppm while uh, drug substance and excipient 2 are uh, out of the limit 800 and 800 ppm however if we have if we see if the cumulative daily exposure in mg if we see it is 3.64 so it is complying with the criteria of 4.5 4.1 mg per day so the daily exposure 3.64 is less than 4.1 mg hence this example is satisfying the option 2 criteria and this can be used now subsequently we will see another example so uh, considering the same uh, here only you can see the concentration of drug substance also acetonitrile content is 800 ppm 0.24 mg excipient 1 in the previous example was 400 which was complying now in this example it is given to be as 2000 ppm which will definitely not comply rest apart everything remains same so if we can see for option 1 that is 410 ppm neither of the values for excipient 1, 2 or drug substance are meeting with the criteria and for drug product you can see is 5.08 mg which is also not complying with the option 2 criteria for PDE value. Now in such a case what is to be done there are some actions that need to be proposed. So actions can be to test the drug product to determine if the formulation process reduces the level of acetonitrile to an acceptable content if the level is not reduced uh, during the formulation process then we have to take some additional steps to reduce the amount to the acceptable limit if all the steps fail to reduce the level then maybe it may be not be acceptable but in some exceptional cases the manufacturer could provide a summary of the efforts that he has made to reduce the level of solvents to meet the guidance value and also provide a risk benefit analysis to support the product use if we look into the analytical procedures part residual solvents are typically determined using chromatographic techniques like the gas chromatography and any harmonized procedure for determining the levels of residual solvents in the pharmacopias can be used however it is feasible manufacturers are free to select the most appropriate and validated method if only class 3 solvents are present a non-specific method such as loss and drying can also be used validation of methods for residual solvent should confirm with the ICH guideline on validation of analytical procedures that is ICH Q6 so we look into the reporting of residual solvents uh, as a manufacturer of pharmaceutical product and to determine the level of residual solvents the manufacturer should have a certain information about the level of residual solvents and the amount of solvents in the excipients in the drug substance hence they had to calculate and meet the criteria so the 
information regarding the uh, values of the residual solvents present into the excipients is expected from the supplier of the excipients of the drug substance. If only class 3 solvents are likely to be present, then the supplier can uh, ensure that loss on drying is less than 0.5%. If only class 2 solvents are present where XY represents these solvents, then uh, all the values of uh, concentration in ppm is below option 1 limit that is defined into this guideline here the supplier would name the class 2 solvents if only class 2 solvents and class 3 solvents are likely to be present then residual solvents of class 2 are below option 1 uh, concentration ppm and the residual solvents of class 3 are below 0.5% and if class 1 solvents are likely to be present, all of these solvents are identified and quantified. If solvents of class 2 or class 3 are present at greater than option 1 limits or 0.5% respectively, they should be identified and quantified. Likely to be present here refers to the solvent used in the final manufacturing step or the solvents that are used in the earlier steps and not removed consistently by the validated process. So if you look at the limits of the residual solvents, the class 1 solvents that we have seen that are to be avoided, the clearly the concentration limit in ppm has been given. For example, benzene, the limit is 2 ppm, carbon tetrachloride it is 4 ppm, etc. For class 2 solvents, these are to be limited. In this case, you can see both the limits that is uh, PP, PDE value as well as concentration limit in ppm is given. So these values uh, we did not calculate for the solvents. They can be directly used with reference to this guideline. Class 3 solvents, they are low toxic potential solvents and this uh, only examples are given like acetic acid, acetone, heptane, etc. And they have a huge PDE value of more than 50 mg per day, which is uh, around 5000 ppm. And the fourth category is no adequate toxicological data. So there are a few example given like uh, dithoxypropane, uh, isooctane, etc. So these are the ones where adequate toxicological data is not present. As we have uh, seen, we will not go into the details of the appendix part. However, the important part for this guidelines we have covered and hence the, this brings us to the end of this presentation. Hope you have enjoyed it. Kindly subscribe for further such videos. Thank you.